Hello guys, Oscar Hotel 8, Sierra, Tango, November here from Survival Tech Nord. Today we're talking about Winterfield Day 2021, the tests I want to carry out, and my objectives for the event. Now I'm fairly certain many of you have seen my winter deployments before, either Winterfield Day or other freestyle winter deployments. Usually, with each year having a specific objective or goal in regards to learning and deployment. In that respect, 2021 really isn't that different, but there are some changes in the station I'd like to make. But before I do that, I want to get some testing out of the way to ensure it's the right path moving forward. Now, I'm absolutely satisfied with my shelter. I'm still using the Nortent Gamme 4 with a wood stove, but I want to experiment with some other sources of heat, which might be better optimized for a rapid deployment type scenario. I'm also hoping to test or successfully test some what may appear to be radical changes to the way I operate data modes in the field. Now, in Winterfield Day 2020, I used the Yaesu FT891, but this year I'll be using the ICOM IC705, which tops out at 10 watts. Operating low power definitely has its challenges, but it also has its benefits. The most notable of these benefits is our portable power supplies. We have the benefit of carrying a smaller power supply, smaller solar panels, or hand crank generator. Now the flip side of that coin is energy efficiency. Of course we're using less power so it's more difficult to be heard. So we need to ensure we use the most efficient data modes to get our signals out and heard around the world. Anyway, I think that's enough of a lead in for you. You see where this video is going. So, as I always say, stick with me and I'll tell you all about it. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems this station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign area. So as I mentioned earlier, last year's Winterfield Day, I used the Yezu FT891. It's an excellent radio. The only thing it's missing is an internal audio card for data modes. But basically, I'm pretty happy with that radio. Now for this year, I decided to use a different radio, a low power radio, and that's the ICOM IC705. Now, I kind of fell into this idea of more power means more contacts. However, this isn't necessarily the right way to think in regards to preparedness or emergency communications. With the Yezu FT891, I'm constantly drawing about one amp of current when the radio is basically just sitting there doing nothing except receiving. Even if I turn the power down to 5 watts, I'm still using 5 amps of overhead on the FT891 just to power it and transmit at its lowest setting. So when a radio has this much of current overhead, we need a larger solar generator, we need larger solar panels or hand crank generator to keep it topped up for the duration of the deployment. Without logistics, this is unsustainable. So this year I'll be testing low power communications using the ICOM IC705, WinLink email, and JS8 call. Now I know this strategy isn't going to help me win the contest aspect of Winterfield Day, but it certainly is more representative of a potential emergency communications scenario I might find myself in, in the real world. So narrow bandwidth data modes using a low power radio with low current draw with a smaller power supply all coming together as a more efficient, more clever way of operating. So now let's talk about heating the shelter. Heating is extremely important at 65 degrees north and there's no way any of us are actually going to operate sustainably over a long period of time without heating or shelters. Now, I don't mind using the titanium wood stove. It's actually magnificent, basically weighs nothing, and I can use whatever fuel I happen to find where I'm going to operate. But in a rapid deployment scenario, such as winter field day, maybe we need to rethink this heating problem. Consider this for a moment. We either bring a lightweight titanium wood stove, which weighs nothing, 
But then we need to find fuel once we arrive at where we're going to operate. Or we take a different strategy looking at this as a rapid deployment scenario where we're not going to be out for that long, perhaps, and we want to heat the shelter as rapidly as possible and get our radio and communications gear set up so that we can actually start operating. So I've pulled the trigger on a Mr. Heater Little Buddy. This is a portable propane heater which will operate on either propane or butane, the same type of butane that operates my jet boil, for example. The idea here is I'm using a ski hulk anyway. The weight I have to carry really doesn't matter as long as it's not more than a few extra kilos. This means I can really take care of the comfort in the station, set up the radio gear, and once the radio gear is set up, once the shelter is heated up, then I can go search for fuel for the wood stove, if required. Honestly though, if I think about it, I would rather have sausages and hot coffee rather than frostbite and exposure as we did back in the day. Now even if I was some sort of mountaineer or expedition specialist capable of operating and sustaining myself in minus temperatures, my radio equipment and the rest of the gear I require might not be able to. So there's a couple of things that'll kill a radio out in the field. That's condensation and of course operating at a temperature which it wasn't designed for. The IC705 user manual says we can operate down to minus 10 Celsius. So with the wood stove running, I can definitely keep the temperature above freezing inside the bunker. Of course, this also means we need to get outside the shelter and find fuel for the wood stove. The point here is heating the shelter is not only good practice for ourselves, it's also good practice for our equipment. Now we all have our own type of conditions to deal with wherever we are around the world. Some people have to deal with the rattlesnakes and sandstorms. I need to deal with extreme cold temperatures. So whatever we're dealing with, let's make sure we equip ourselves so that we can actually sustain ourselves in the conditions we're trying to deal with. So now that I've got my camp set up, the tent is good and there's enough heat and shelter for me, I have to take a look at the radio and see what I can do to prevent any mishaps from taking out my radio during this event. So I've added a cage to the ICOM IC705. It comes from a company called POV Mounts from California. The cage offers a carry handle, two side handles, and a bezel frame to protect the rotary encoders on the radio from damage if you happen to drop the radio face down. So the cage also has hard points tapped into the bezel frame, allowing operators to attach other accessories to the radio which would normally be flopping around attached to a cable or something like that. The frame was quite easy to install and it only required a couple of hand tools. No disassembly of the radio was required for the additional layer of protection and anyone can actually install this cage onto their 705. I think the only thing I need now is a shield of some sort to put in front of the touch screen during transportation to and from my operating locations. The cage isn't cheap, but it offers a level of protection for the front panel of the 705, which I haven't seen previously. I think if we're going to spend this amount of money on such a magnificent radio, we should also be willing to flip a few coins to make sure it has the adequate protection it needs for the front panel. So now let's change our focus from the radio over to the software and the systems hosting the software. What you're looking at now is the ICOM IC705, a Raspberry Pi Zero, a Raspberry Pi 4 Bravo, and a relatively low power and low energy nano PC called the Larkbox Pro. 
The Lark Box Pro is an x86 64-bit PC running Windows 10. Naturally, as an x86 PC, this can run any software we would run on a normal size laptop or desktop. In this case, we're running WinLink Express with a VADA HF modem. The Lark Box Pro will be my primary operating PC for winter field day and a rather radical detachment from the Raspberry Pi based systems you would normally see on the channel. The reason for this radical change in operating is the decision to operate using low power. Avara HF is vastly superior to RDOP in regards to weak signal performance and is much less susceptible to QRM. So if I'm going to have any success at all during winter field day using WinLink, I'll need to use the best mode giving the best chance for the weak signal operator. So you can actually see the Lark Box Pro is, uh, well, it's relatively the same size as my Raspberry Pi 4 Bravo just next to it. The difference between the Raspberry Pi 4 and the Lark Box Pro, of course, is the Lark Box Pro is ready to go. The real-time clock is already integrated, USB ports are there, there's nothing to add on to it. You simply plug it in, configure your software, and you'll be ready to go. Now you can run Windows or Linux on this box, but I chose Windows because I'm desperately trying to use VADA HF in the field. Now I couldn't afford a rugged tablet, so that was a no-go. Uh, the Raspberry Pi was too much of a fragile piece of equipment for the conditions I'm operating in. Plus, I couldn't run VADA on it. So the only other option was to choose another type of PC, in this case a nano PC, to run that software. Now this doesn't mean the Raspberry Pi is of no use to us anymore, of course it still is. But I've relegated the Raspberry Pi 4 Bravo to backup status for winter field day. I'll be using it as a backup computer along with the Zygu X5105, which is my backup radio for winter field day. So I've got the X5105, I've got the Raspberry Pi 4 Bravo, and I've got a new data mode interface from XGG Comms called the Digimode 4. It's special because it's a one wire interface and dual interface, so to speak, because it has an audio interface and cat control built in to a single board. Now, as you know, Winterfield Day, at least for me and probably for many of the people who watch my channel, it's about testing our gear. Well, I think I may very well just put the Zygo X5105 with the Digimode 4 interface to the test. There's no better way to understand the reliability of our gear unless we actually throw it in the fire to see what happens. So maybe we'll run two radios on Winterfield Day. Let's see how that goes. Now, I've also made some changes to the Raspberry Pi 4 Bravo. Changes which, in my opinion, will make it more robust, more reliable, and less of a toy. So I've got a new hat for the Raspberry Pi 4 Bravo from UU Gear. It's called the Witty Pi 3. The Witty Pi 3 has a few features that are important to us as ham radio operators. First of all, it's got an on-off switch. It also has a real-time clock built in and it has a wide voltage input. Now in regards to Raspberry Pi power, UU Gear has a couple of interesting products. There's the Witty Pi 3 we just talked about a couple of moments ago, and there's also something called the Zero to Go, which doesn't have a real-time clock, but it has an even wider voltage input. Anyway, we'll come back to both of these boards after winter field day. Now, if you go back to the Lark Box Pro for a moment, there were a few enablers which made what you're looking at on your screen possible. Just like with the Raspberry Pi, we needed to install a hotspot so that I could connect to the LarkBox Pro with my Android tablet. The tool I'm using for a hotspot on Windows 10 is called Connectify. And yes, there's a free version, although I'm using the Pro version so that I can have a custom SSID. Now we also needed some software to run on the LarkBox Pro to enable remote connections. 
I'm very familiar with VNC style servers and clients, so I went for a tight VNC server. The tight VNC server is very similar to the real VNC server running on a Raspberry Pi, but there are some benefits to using tight VNC over the real VNC server. Firstly, with tight VNC, you can connect IP address to IP address client to server directly from your local network. In contrast, real VNC server demands that you connect through their cloud. Well, from where I'm standing, that kind of defeats the purpose of an off-grid winter field day. So we use tight VNC server to connect in our local network wirelessly between our Android tablet or mobile phone and the Lark Box Pro. So the screen we're looking at now is actually from my Android tablet. We're connecting to the Lark Box Pro with VNC client to the tight VNC server running on the Lark Box Pro. We can interact with all of the applications and features of the software running on the Lark Box Pro like JS8 Call or WinLink um, or anything else. Now I know the question is going to come up, Julian, why don't you just use a tablet and connect that to your radio so that you don't have to go through all these hoops? The simple truth is I want to be completely untethered from the radio and computer. When we're operating in the bunker, I want to set up the radio on its little table, as you see. And I want to be able to move freely around the bunker to do what I want to do where I want to do it without the inconvenience of having that tether between my laptop or tablet and the radio and computer. So here we are again with my testing setup. This is the ICOM IC705. And we have the Android tablet connecting to the Lark Box Pro over the VNC server and access point, which we have running on the Lark Box Pro. So we have no physical connection between the radio and the tablet or the Lark Box Pro and the tablet. Anyway, I hope this isn't too abstract. It's almost identical to what we've done with the Raspberry Pi, but with a system which is basically more robust and easier to deploy than the Raspberry Pi. Now it's about time for us to start talking about portable power and charging. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this video, the goal is to use lower power with narrow bandwidth data modes to augment the lack of a broad signal and much more power. So realistically, the true experiment during this winter field day is seeing if we can sustain our communications at the station using a much lower wattage panel than we normally would if we were deploying a QRO station. So lighter, much lower wattage solar panels, along with a portable power supply, which is also smaller in capacity than we would normally use. So the portable power supply I'm using is the Powerfilm Lightsaber Max. You've certainly seen this on the channel before. I'll be using two of them in parallel, at least that's what I'm going to attempt. So I've never done this before, but if we don't try during testing, we won't know if it's actually viable later down the line when our lives depend on it. Now to keep the lightsaber max set topped up, I'll be using two 28 watt rollable panels from Powerfilm Solar. Now there's really two important reasons for using the rollable series. Firstly, they're completely waterproof. And secondly, I can just leave them outside the shelter without having to take care about bringing them in, regardless of the weather conditions they are deployed in. Now I'm using two 28 watt panels rather than a single, for example, 60 watt panel, simply for redundancy. So just in case my portable power experiment completely fails, I do have a backup plan. I'll continue to use the two 28 watt rollables from Powerfilm, but I'll augment that with a 20 amp hour lithium iron phosphate pack I built and a charge controller from Genison called the GV Boost. Now the GV Boost is absolutely incredible in low light conditions like we have up here in higher latitudes. 
So it'll charge our lithium iron phosphate batteries earlier and keep charging them later in the day because of that inbuilt boost controller. So where we benefit from its low light performance, it lacks the power distribution we've seen, for example, with the Buddy Pole Power Mini. But if you're at a higher latitude, perhaps this might be a better solution for winter ops. So it's really been a crazy past couple of months. The research, the testing, all of the background work which goes into putting something together like this. Now it's been an insane amount of work, but honestly, I'm extremely stoked to share this video with all of you. Now I'd be a liar if I said I wasn't nervous about winter field day. But just like we have to learn and evolve as we go along, we also need to take what we've learned and create a better station using that knowledge. So if there's anything you can take away from this video, it should be our stations evolve. And the evolution of our stations comes from the research, the testing, and the field trials. This is why we have events such as Winter Field Day. So let me know what your Winter Field Day plans are in the comments. And don't forget, you can reach me during Winter Field Day using JS8 Call or WinLink email. Rock and roll, guys. Thanks for watching. Ciao.